For 300 years, Port Royal, the pirate city, has been hidden at the bottom of the Caribbean. It's a city that was literally swallowed by the sea. But now, a new investigation is about to drain the ocean, pull the plug on the Caribbean, and reveal what was known as the wickedest city on Earth. It was the greatest buccaneering captain of all time. We uncover remarkable new evidence revealing the extraordinary catastrophe that destroyed it. An earthquake, a tsunami, and deadly quicksand. It was a scene of absolute and utter devastation. A city believed to be so sinful, it deserved the wrath of God. Port Royal was the biblical Sodom and Gomorrah rolled into one. A team of scientists equipped with cutting-edge tools now tackle the mysteries of Port Royal. How exactly did the disaster unfold? Why did the city sink in a matter of minutes? Drain dry, we reveal the most notorious pirate city of all time, as you've never seen it before. Imagine you could drain the ocean. Pull the plug on the water to reveal what lies on the seabed. Now, powerful new technology can do just that. Digital photos and sonar scans give us remarkable new insights into the sunken ruins. Using this new data, we're able to uncover the lost world of Port Royal. In the 17th century, Port Royal on the south coast of Jamaica was an English stronghold at the heart of the Spanish Empire, dominating what would become Kingston Harbour from the end of a long spit of land. If you've seen the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, the first town you go to where we meet Jack Sparrow is Port Royal. Grown fat on the profits of piracy, Port Royal was a city of up to 8,000, the ultimate boom town of the New World but it was also known as the wickedest city on earth. It certainly had more bars and brothels than any other city in the whole of the English colonies. For the port indeed is very loose in itself. Tis now more room than e'er was Sodom, filled with all manner of debauchery. On June the 7th, 1692, disaster struck Port Royal. A massive earthquake wiped two-thirds of the city off the map, sending it to the bottom of the sea. Now, archaeologist John Henderson, an expert in sunken cities, will use new technology to discover just how the disaster unfolded. Port Royal sank so fast that it took its secrets with it. This is a true sunken city, but not only that, it's a catastrophic site. It went down so quickly that it sealed a moment in time. It's sometimes called the, the Pompeii of the New World. It's now underwater for us to discover, and that's really rare in archaeology. Using cutting-edge technology, John's mission is to rediscover the sunken city and create a precise digital model of its ruins. Data which will reveal how the city was torn apart in two minutes of terror. John's findings will support a bid for UNESCO World Heritage status, reinforcing Port Royal's global importance and help conserve the ruins for the future. It's a huge challenge, but if it works, the data will allow us to virtually drain the ocean. Strip away millions of gallons of water. Finally bringing the sunken city of Port Royal back into the light of day. Well, Port Royal's certainly something I read about as a boy, and reading about, you know, a sunken pirate town instantly becomes attractive. So, for me, that's a real exciting appeal. 
The sunken city lies just offshore from the modern-day fishing village of Port Royal. But where exactly? To survey the underwater ruins, John must first locate them. I think the most mysterious thing about Port Royal is no one's really entirely sure what's down there. But traces of the 300-year-old city can still be found. This is quite a substantial wall. So this is a wall from a building. This is marking out a house. It's only a fragment of the lost city. Most of it lies hidden beneath feet of sediment and dead coral. Just think what could be down there. There'll be hundreds of buildings sealed under the coral, with all the contents intact. To reveal the true scale of Port Royal, John's going to need the latest scanning equipment. His survey aims to unlock the secrets of those hidden buildings, ultimately going beyond what the eye can see. So this is actually a really challenging site to work on, because the visibility is actually quite bad. This is why it's never been mapped properly. Sometimes when you dive, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. The terrible visibility has hampered previous surveys, so John's harnessed the most powerful digital technology available. So this is a cutting-edge piece of kit that's just never been used before in an archaeological site. So this is the first time we'll be testing it. It has the potential to bring the site to life, to do a 3D model of it. The Autonomous Surface Vehicle, or ASV, fires sonar signals to measure the variations in the height of the seabed. Now, well, this is the first mission that we're going to run over the site, and um, the conditions are absolutely perfect today. The ASV can mark out the walls and boundaries of the sunken city, so John can create a 3D model. So it'd be really good to see that data and see if we're actually picking up the buildings in 3D. But what did the lost city look like? A different technique can tell us. An autonomous underwater vehicle, or AUV, will capture thousands of images using a technique called photogrammetry. Together, both underwater drones will enable us to visualize the ruined city in high definition for the first time. It will unlock a new vision of Port Royal and reveal clues to the catastrophe that destroyed the city. This is no easy mission. Visibility is often atrocious and the survey vessels are working in the mouth of a busy harbour. We should be hitting the site, the main part of the site now. But just hours into the survey, plans go badly wrong. A motorboat has strayed into the survey area. So there's a bit of an incident. We're trying to retrieve the vehicle. Uh, we don't know where it is right now because a boat came through and cut the line we're using to track it. So we have one of our guys out there uh, looking to see if he can find it visually. Um, basically a boat's hit the um, AUV and it's knocked the antenna off. The team discovers the damage is worse than they thought. Yeah, this is pretty much the worst case scenario. Yeah, we've uh, lost the vehicle. The photo survey is incomplete and the accident has written off half a million dollars worth of equipment. Five things have right off. We can't replace this one. Not now. All we can do is come back. Pretty gutting. At least the first survey by the ASV has worked. The team are getting data on the depths of the seabed that will help them to map the lost city. We've got the flat bit where you've got the survival of the, the sunken town itself. It's an encouraging start but it's only half the data they need. John will have to return to complete the photo scanning of the lost city's buildings. Draining the sea beyond Port Royal can explain why it became a pirate powerhouse. It's all down to its location, right at the entrance of Kingston Harbour. Pulling the plug on these Caribbean waters, we reveal one of the world's largest natural harbours. At 10 miles long and 2 miles wide, it's large enough to shelter hundreds of ships 
from the hurricane-whipped tropical seas. Better still was the long finger of land on which Port Royal was built. One of the things we'll see is the spit coming out into this very deep harbour. Its steep sides made it the perfect location to dock ships. Near deep water on either side, large ships could come up and get very close to the shore very quickly. This might seem the perfect spot to build a port, but made of constantly shifting sand, the spit would be Port Royal's undoing. The main problem is there is no solid geology down there for a very long way. So in an earthquake, when that starts to shake, you're in trouble. I very much doubt that anybody in Port Royal realised they were sitting on a time bomb. Seven months after the photogrammetry survey equipment was destroyed, John Henderson is back. This time, photographer Simon Brown will do the job of the AUV and take photos of the sunken city. As the visibility is so bad, Simon has to get very close to the ruins and take thousands of images. Just three days later, the photos have been compiled into a 3D representation of what lies below. Okay, Simon, show me what we've got then. It's not been easy but we've, we've captured quite a lot of Building 5. Building 5 may once have been a grand family home. All that remains of it now is one room, and it's showing up in unprecedented detail. I mean, this looks fantastic, given the conditions you were working in. I mean, we can see they've got the wall, you can actually see the courtyard next to it, you can see the fire pit, you can see the low walls. This is great, we can actually see the individual bricks themselves. For me what's exciting is you can show that to someone and they can instantly see what's actually down there. I didn't think you would get results as good as this. John's mission is now delivering spectacular results. Remarkable photographic data can reveal crucial evidence lying on the seabed. The brick foundations of lost homes. We can add to that the data from the sonar scan of the seabed. In 3D, we see the relief of the sunken city. And it reveals the edge of Port Royal for the first time. These are the surviving 13 acres of the lost city. You can see the area of the sunken city. You can see the extents of it for the first time. And that's quite exciting. With the data, we can reconstruct Port Royal's buildings. We can pull the plug on Kingston Harbour, draining the ocean from the lost city. Resurrecting Port Royal from its watery grave. Sunlight can hit its streets once again. We're beginning to reconstruct, for the first time in 300 years really, what exactly is there. Now we can shed light on the extraordinary disaster that destroyed Port Royal. Drowning hundreds of houses and its mighty forts. We're draining the ocean around Port Royal, the sunken pirate city. For the first time, we can see it in its entirety, since an earthquake sent it to the bottom of the sea 300 years ago. Now we can discover if this was the wickedest city on Earth. Since the 1950s, three archaeological expeditions have sifted Port Royal's underwater ruins to uncover its pirate past. And in the 1980s, 
a team discovered part of the fabric of the city itself. During that 10 years, we excavated five buildings pretty much completely. It was the most exciting excavation I've ever conducted. Now, we can use science to map these discoveries. From three archaeological excavations, right across the sunken city. Thousands of relics from a lost world. All clues to Port Royal's cataclysmic final day. Because this is a catastrophic site, it sealed a whole range of, of goods that were being used at a particular moment in time. Each one is an insight into the 17th century world of Caribbean pirates. So we can get actual snapshots and glimpses into daily life. From pewter tableware to Chinese porcelain and signs of personal wealth. The archaeological record at Port Royal shows how quite rich it was, because usually towns in the New World are impoverished copies of those in Europe, whereas Port Royal actually stacks up against the capitals of Europe. But how did Port Royal grow so rich? The city was built from the wealth of stolen Spanish treasure. In the 1650s, England and Spain were at war. Jamaica, an English territory in the Caribbean, lay surrounded on all sides by the Spanish main. From Florida through Mexico and South America. Port Royal on Jamaica's south coast began as a small outpost of the English Empire. But the scale of Fort Charles shows just how important it soon became. So this fort was built to defend the entrance into Kingston Harbour, which is one of the, the biggest harbours in the Caribbean. You could get 500 ships in here. To gain the upper hand over the Spanish, the English enlisted the help of pirates. In 1657, the Lieutenant Governor of Port Royal actually invited the pirates to come here and to act as a kind of unofficial defence force. To the English government, pirates who attack Spanish goods and bring them to English ports could be an asset. Pirates were licensed to raid the Spanish at sea or on land. They became known as buccaneers or privateers. What happens in Port Royal really is state-sanctioned piracy. And in Port Royal, at the heart of the Caribbean, the buccaneers were perfectly placed, in striking distance of the main shipping routes between the New World and Europe. If the Spanish are going to try and get anything home, they have to get it past Port Royal. So it's rather like a fox sitting in the middle of a chicken coop full of chickens. It made Port Royal the buccaneering capital of the world. It's rumoured that pirate treasure looted from the Spanish still survives in Port Royal. A silver communion service believed to have been raided from Panama in 1671. It's exactly the kind of thing that pirates would have been interested in. Silver, gold, anything that was valuable, that was grabbed in raids, that would then come through the docks of Port Royal. The merchants would get rich, the pirates would get rich, the local taverns would get rich. This is what Port Royal was based on. By agreement, the English crown took a quarter of the plunder. All the rest was shared between the pirates themselves. Well, on the very first buccaneering expedition, 1659, the fleet brought back the modern equivalent of 75 million US dollars. The Spanish wealth that hits Port Royal in periodic waves is colossal. Massive injections of cash transformed this fortified outpost into a boom town. Archaeologists have created plans of the lost city based on historical descriptions and maps. So John's surveying the streets from modern-day Port Royal to see how they connect with the underwater ruins. 
We know from the plans that the modern fishing village actually follows the same orientation. So the streets are the same as they would have been in the 17th century. So Queen Street, which was one of the main thoroughfares, runs right down there and then it stops when it hits the sea. We know it continues on into the sunken city. Archaeologists have traced Queen Street, reaching out 300 feet under the sea. Mapping on the city plan, we can reveal its full scale. A dense network of streets, covering over 50 acres, all guarded by three imposing sea-facing forts. Inside the city walls, Port Royal was as crowded as 17th century London. If you are at Port Royal in the heyday, you know, you would have come to a town which was absolutely crammed with people in this small area. Clues on the seabed reveal Port Royal's similarities to London extended even to its architecture. You had this very same intensity of brick structures going up three and four stories, steeply pitched roofs, very, very narrow frontages, very deep lots, backyards, front yards. The drain city reveals as many as 2,000 brick and timber houses crammed around Port Royal streets. Home to a growing population that would reach almost 8,000 at its height. But the crowded narrow streets would become a death trap when the earthquake struck. We're on a very enclosed, very overcrowded peninsula. We've got people living here side by side in two to four storey dwellings. When the earthquake struck, there was nowhere to run. By the 1670s, Port Royal had become the Las Vegas of its time. I mean, this is almost like a frontier town, if you like. It's like a gold rush town in the 17th century in the Americas. And people sailed out here from England to get rich quick. With such fortunes to be made, traders, merchants and craftsmen all flocked to the pirate city. Some would become the equivalent of millionaires overnight. There's a story that one Randy Buccaneer gave the most beautiful prostitute in town a thousand pounds just to do a strip tease before they went to bed together. But was Port Royal the wickedest city on earth? Remarkable discoveries from this lost world reveal why Port Royal earned its reputation. A building on Lime Street contained vital clues. Over 60 artifacts. All of them bottles. When we excavated Building 1 at Port Royal, it was pretty obviously a tavern. You know, there was like over 60 bottles in the back room of it, still corked. What archaeologists had discovered was just one of Port Royal's many drinking dens. Historical records tell of there being hundreds of taverns, perhaps as many as one for every ten residents. John's diving over the remains of the sunken tavern. It's here the pirates would have spent a lot of their money on alcohol. It's hard to imagine the kind of debauchery and drunkenness that went on in this place. Buccaneers poured their wealth into rum, wine and women. <laughs> if you're a typical buccaneer, you spend it on pleasure. And there's an awful lot of pleasure available in Port Royal in the shape of alcohol, good food and sex. Port Royal's seedy aside became notorious. These taverns may fitly be called brothel houses. These were haunts of such a crew of vile strumpets and common prostitutes, it is almost impossible to civilize the town. In the 17th century world, it seemed that Port Royal was ripe for the wrath of God. Some even believed it deserved to be wiped from the face of the earth. But no one could have predicted the triple catastrophe that was to overtake it. Traces of that disaster are still here on the seafloor.
were draining the ocean from around Port Royal, revealing the most notorious pirate city the world has ever known. To shed new light on the triple catastrophe that sank the city beneath the sea in an extraordinary apocalyptic end. From the thousands of clues uncovered from the seabed, there is one chilling piece of evidence of when the earthquake struck. A 17th century pocket watch, its hands long since rusted in the sea. But closer analysis of the find revealed something intriguing. When it was x-rayed, it was seen that the hands had actually stopped at 1143. Now we know from the historical records that the earthquake apparently hit just before noon. And this has been taken by some to say that the hands of that watch stopped exactly when the earthquake struck. But what powerful natural forces set the earthquake in motion? To find the answer, we're draining the ocean not just from Port Royal, but from the whole of Jamaica, to reveal the source of the earthquake. It lies hidden in the dark, thousands of feet beneath the surface. As you drain the ocean from around Jamaica, what you see is these giant furrows in the, in the seabed. They're fracture lines running east-west, and they're faults. They're earthquake fault lines. The faults form part of the boundary between two pieces of the Earth's crust, the North American plate and the Caribbean plate to the south. Both are constantly moving. It's a place where the, the gradual motions of the plate either side get snagged, stress builds up. Essentially, it's an earthquake zone. And Port Royal sits right in the middle of it. And in the case of 1692, that stress that it built up very, very gradually over time gets unleashed into this, this huge earthquake. As the stress in the Earth's crust is released, it propels a powerful seismic wave into the surroundings. The 7th of June, 1692. Doomsday at Port Royal begins like any other day. There are daily prayers in the churches, business begins at sunrise. People were just going about their business. Travelling up to five miles per second, the seismic pulse was heading straight for Port Royal. There's records of one guy about to go and have sherry with the lieutenant governor that morning. There was no indication of what was about to come. Port Royal's alleyways and buildings were full of people. Its wharfs and docks crowded with merchant ships. I think the first indication we've got is, is a, a bang, a noise in the north, in the mountains, and, and a kind of low rumbling. Well, the records we have suggest there was three pulses from the earthquake. It was what's to come that was the real killer. For the shake was so violent that it threw people down on their knees. Chasms opened up in the ground. We felt the house shake and saw the bricks begin to rise in the floor. The ground heaved and swelled like a rolling, swelling sea. People ran for their lives from the falling masonry. But the city offered no refuge. Port Royal was almost the worst case scenario. Really tall buildings made of brick with narrow streets. So if you're in those streets, it's almost impossible. Your choice of whether to stay in a building or to get in the street is, it's a lot of people. The earthquake was just the beginning. It alone doesn't explain how Port Royal plunged into the sea. It would sink for an entirely different reason. Behind Fort Charles is extraordinary evidence of the terrifying forces growing beneath Port Royal's sandy streets. Well, this is a naval building, but it's actually called the Giddy House just because of the feeling you get when you walk inside it now. Because it's at an angle and the floor is still at floor level, you get a really strange, disorientating feeling when you go inside. The Giddy House is one of the few surviving buildings from an earthquake in 1907. 
So what happened here is similar to what would have happened in 1692, only in 1692 we think the earthquake might even have been stronger and what you actually got were houses sinking 18 foot or so straight down into the sand with everybody still inside them. The climax in that Port Royal earthquake is the most extraordinary event at which we very, very rarely see in earthquakes, which is essentially the buildings which have been shaken and collapsing start to sink into the ground and people with them. Scientists call it liquefaction. For the people of Port Royal, it was hell on earth. The sandy ground where they built their houses turned into a deadly quagmire. So what happens with liquefaction is you've got sand with lots of water in it and as you shake it, it turns into a slurry, it, turns, it liquefies. Rarely captured on camera, this footage reveals the horrors of liquefaction at work in Nagata, Japan, on June the 16th, 1964. The energy from a massive earthquake separated the grains of sediment below the city, allowing water to rush to the surface. Earth turned to quicksand, sucking the city down. The unlucky people of Port Royal wouldn't have known how solid land can become liquid death. Just minutes into the earthquake, the second catastrophe unfolded. As the ground sheared open, water and sand erupted from it. The longer the ground shook, the more liquid the sand became. Grand houses, churches, taverns, and even Port Royal's forts sank like stones. Those houses, which back just now appeared the fairest and loftiest in these parts, were in a moment sunk down into the earth and nothing was to be seen of them. Some people were trapped, half in the sand and half out. The earth received up to their necks and then closed upon them, squeezing them to death with their heads above ground, many of which the dogs eat. Many perished in this quicksand, but there is one incredible story of survival. A French merchant, Louis Galdi, found himself sucked into the ground. Everyone thought he was dead, and then in the succeeding shock he was spat out into the sea, and he survived by swimming to the nearest boat, after which he became a, a really religious man. In all, two-thirds of Port Royal sank. It took with it 2,000 souls and hundreds of buildings. The surviving ruins are in a remarkable state of preservation. Probably the most fascinating thing that I found was how you can sink a building 15 feet from its original elevation and not have a single brick out of place in the floor and these bricks are not mortared together they're just like a, putting a patio in but here they are perfectly intact but now they're 15 feet deep underwater you really get a sense of how it sank down here in one piece the walls are intact the courtyards outside it are intact it's a very eerie feeling it's reported that the city took just a few minutes to disappear into the sea but the chaos the earthquake had unleashed wasn't over. The drained city will offer clues to the third and final catastrophe about to hit Port Royal. was swallowed by the sea in minutes. Survivors saw their families, homes and city sink beneath the waves. With cutting edge technology, we've scanned the disaster zone. Thousands of archeological discoveries were excavated here. Each one tells a story from the moments before Port Royal fell. People cooking at home 
preparing lunch. Taverns filling up with drinkers. On the drained lost city, we can reveal extraordinary evidence that the earthquake delivered one last shock to Port Royal. Embedded in the sea floor are the skeletal remains of a large ship. She lies right amongst the ruins of a house on Lime Street. Well, the clear question is why is there a ship sitting on the floor of a building in Port Royal? The strange discovery was excavated in the 1980s by Donny Hamilton. Now John wants to find out exactly what it tells us about Port Royal's Day of Doom. What we see here is a plan view of Building 5 and Building 4. We came across a timber which turned out to be the keel of a ship. But it was the building near the ship that most surprised Donny. Why wasn't this wall intact like the rest of the ruined buildings? The first thing we noticed was essentially this wall A, B, C, D should form a straight line, but everything has been shoved forward. Not only was the wall out of place, it had been ripped apart and another wall bent. What this is, is a crash site. And it's unusual in archaeology to get an exact moment in time like that preserved. And you can actually see the mechanism of what happened. But how could a ship in harbour have crashed into a house in the middle of town? Would the identity of the stricken ship help solve the mystery? When Donny's team searched the records, they revealed a possible contender. An English warship measuring 74 feet long. Similar to this ship, she was called HMS Swan. We knew from the records that the Swan was in the harbor at the time of the earthquake, and it fits the basic dimensions of the ship that we found in Building 4. It turned out that on the 7th of June, 1692, HMS Swan was being serviced at Port Royal's wharfs. All clues point to one conclusion. You have a ship that would have been sitting in the harbour, a good 200 feet away from this building, has now been deposited, launched actually on top of it. I mean, it's quite clearly evidence of a tsunami. The tsunami was the third cataclysm to hit Port Royal. One eyewitness account tells of the sea retreating from Kingston Harbour before the wave hit. It was a wave similar to the tsunamis that devastated Japan in 2011 and Thailand in 2004. The tsunami would explain what happened to HMS Swan. Now, for the first time, we can reveal her final journey. Empty of ballast, HMS Swan was like a cork on the mighty wave that crashed over Port Royal. She was hurled across the drowned city, washed down Queen Street, finally crashing into a house on Lime Street, piercing its walls with considerable force. The archaeologists have mapped out the fate of Port Royal. But there's one final mystery to solve that could shed further light on how the disaster unfolded. One of Port Royal's largest buildings seems to be missing from the seabed. Fort James. We know from maps that Fort James once sat prominently at the harbour entrance. So it should have shown up in the underwater survey. What's surprising from the 3D survey is there's not a rise or a mound where you would expect something substantial like a fort to be. Now we can accept that it went down in the earthquake, but actually when you look at the plans we have, it looks like it's completely disappeared. Did something else happen during the catastrophe that might explain Fort James's disappearance? It's all the more mysterious given the scale of the building. Like Fort Charles, 
it was a formidable defense for England's largest settlement in the New World. So what other savage forces might have destroyed its mighty walls and ramparts? To find out, John wants to hunt for remains of the fort on the sea floor. So what I want to do is just go in the area where we think it is yep. and just see if we can see anything. Okay. Anything structural, okay. walls, yep. anything sticking up. If John finds anything, then photogrammetry expert Simon Brown will survey the area in detail. So we're looking for large boulders with straight edges, anything uniform shapes, anything. Yeah. Man -made. John's following rumours from previous excavations of large blocks lying on the seabed. He's starting the search in deeper water, beyond the known limits of the sunken city. I think there's always been a mystery over where Fort James is. And we're hoping now, with the technology that we have, that we can at least get an impression of where those parts of the fort still lie and what actually happened to the fort. Any remnants he finds may hold clues to the final part of the disaster that wiped out Port Royal. It's not long before there's a discovery. Just had one of the marker boys come up, uh, and I heard on comms that John has found something. Could it be Fort James, the missing piece of the sunken city? The earthquake that sank Port Royal doesn't explain why one of its largest buildings seems to be missing from the seabed. Now John Henderson may have found some remains of Fort James. So it's time for Simon to scan the site. If they've sent those two marker boys up so quickly, I'm quite confident they've found something that, that they're excited about. Down here we have these massive chunks of bricks, conglomerate and mortar. You can see that these are man-made. They have quite clear edges and right angles in places. Evidence suggests that this block isn't a natural feature of the seabed. So the team record and map the new discovery. Will the survey explain how the fort met its end? So all over the seabed, there's quite clearly big, massive chunks of structure, mortar and conglomerate. Definitely got bits of Fort James down there, and it's in pieces all over the seabed. It's like the structure's gone down and then been broken up by something. John's located Fort James for the first time. It's not where it should be on the sea floor. And there's very little left of it. What does it reveal about the disaster? So this is one of the sections that we managed to locate of what we believe to be Fort James. This is a scan of a large section of wall, a remnant of the mighty fort. Unlike the other buildings that sank, it's not intact. How did it end up smashed to pieces? When the earthquake hit, it slid into the harbour. It had the whole weight of the, of the city behind it. It began to break up, whereas other parts, you know, liquefied, went straight down. This one was pushed over more, and then it got the full brunt of the tsunami, and that started to break it up into pieces. The obliteration of Fort James suggests that there was more than one tsunami. It was the cruel and final twist inflicted by the earthquake. And once again, its cause was down to Port Royal's location in Kingston Harbour. So the irony is you've got this, this harbour that's a sheltered location, offers protection to boats from storms and it ends up being absolutely lethal in the earthquake. Kingston Harbour amplified the tsunami. So you imagine this wave rushing into this, this little bay, and of course there's nowhere for it to go. In the harbour, the tsunami reflected off every shore, sending multiple waves smashing through the northern edge of the sunken city, breaking up Fort James and scattering it across the seafloor. It's almost like you've taken a bathtub and you're just shaking around like that and it's sloshing up here and sloshing up there. But it just adds to the kind of, to the terror and the frenzy of the whole event. Port Royal had been laid to waste by an earthquake 
quicksand and multiple tsunami waves. The disaster had left the city cut off from the mainland. All that remained was a devastated island and thousands of dead bodies. A multitude of whose corpses floated a great many days after from one side of the harbour to the other caused such an intolerable stench that the dead were like to destroy the living. When news of the disaster arrived in Europe, it seemed that God had finally delivered his judgment on the wicked pirate city. When the news reaches the home country, there's quite a widespread feeling that the wickedest city in the English-speaking world has just got its just desserts. So it was seen as divine retribution. It was seen as just punishment for the lewd and terrible behaviour that took place in Port Royal. By this terrible judgment, God will make them reform their lives, for there was not a more ungodly people on the face of the earth. Port Royal never recovered its former glory. The trading jewel of the Caribbean had been wiped off the face of the earth. It's interesting to think if the earthquake hadn't actually struck here, that this place could have developed somewhere like Manhattan or somewhere like Hong Kong. But in the end, it was Port Royal's lethal location on an active fault zone and deadly quicksand that sealed its fate. The reality was that this was a city that the English had built in a place they shouldn't have built. So it was a, an event, a tragedy, a disaster that was brought on by humans, not by nature or God. John Henderson's work is the first complete underwater survey of the sunken pirate city. It may help secure UNESCO World Heritage status to protect the site from the ravages of nature. The sea is reclaiming the site again. It swallowed it up once and it wants it back. But thanks to the use of science and stunning computer imagery, Port Royal's incredible story can live on. The most notorious pirate city of all time. Smashed to pieces by a massive earthquake, then sucked into the sea by deadly quicksand with multiple tsunamis, the final blow, a triple catastrophe that ended the life of the wickedest city on earth. <laughs> <laughs>